In today's episode, pardon me, we open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 24. The one true God has been giving Moses alone the statutes and laws his people will follow. Now God summons key men and elders from among the people to come and worship on the mountain, but from afar. Moses descends then to relay God's covenant to all the people who unanimously agree to abide by it. The matter is sealed by a sacrifice. Then Moses enters the cloud and stormy presence of Yahweh for 40 days and 40 nights. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, December 13th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, the program where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. We give thanks for our sponsor, the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Listen, they do great work for God's church, so learn more about their translating and publishing efforts at lhfmissions.org. Well, join me now in welcoming my guest, regular contributor to the show, the Reverend John Lukomsky, pastor emeritus and co-host of Wrestling with the Basics, also on KFUO. Pastor Lukomsky, good morning. Happy St. Lucie Day. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Pastor Boo, are you are you like six foot away from the the the, the microphone there? Because I, I I am actually infected. <laughs> I I'm playing oh, no. hurt. I I have COVID. I'm actually in my isolation room in the upstairs of our house. Thank heavens we're not doing this face to face because I would have had to cancel as we had to cancel many events this week. Oh. <laughs> you know before Christmas. Well, I hope. But, uh, well, I hope you're feeling okay. I mean, I'm glad you're able to join us, but I hope everything's okay with the breathing and the and the you know no coughing or anything like that, no fevers. Well, the fever's gone. We we did have that. We we did have the congestion. That seems like that's better. And I certainly hope I don't have to cough throughout this show. <laughs> but at this I point, I think I so, so I'm I'm blessed. I really am blessed, uh, Pastor Boo, and that that you don't because I we've had people in our church that have had very very hospitalization even kind of thing. So uh, we were fully vaccinated. I don't know if that made a difference or not. Uh, but but yeah, no, it, it's not been a really bad experience, except it's so frustrating. My poor wife is downstairs and I'm upstairs and I know that drives her crazy and I know it drives me crazy too. But oh. it's only a matter of days and, and things will get back to normal. So For sure. Well, you're kind of old school, right? I don't even know anybody that gets COVID anymore, but here comes Lekomsky (laughs) with some COVID. Well, I do hope, I I pray that you get better very soon, and I hope it doesn't uh, become anything serious. Well, Uh, well, you know, that that, that you mentioned that, I I dodged it for all this time. I had not had it before, but yeah, of Mm. course, you know, I had to get it. I guess I had to join the crowds. Have you had it? I I don't want to get off subject here, but have have you had the COVID yet? Um, have I? Uh, yes, I, I had it like according to a test, but not really any symptoms at all. Oh, okay. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Well, I tell you what, besides the COVID, any, how are things going through this Advent season? You know, I mean, are, I know that you're not, um, in a parish, but, or maybe you are, I don't remember, but are you preaching for folks? What's going on for Advent for you? Well, see, so here's the, here's the interesting thing when you're retired, unless you're doing a vacancy, yeah, you don't usually have anything to do in December because everybody stays at their own church in December. No one takes vacation during Christmas right. season or during Advent season. So, yeah, I, I, I really haven't had a lot to do except uh, the stuff that we do at KFU. But, yeah, once we get through the new year, I've got a couple of uh, preaching assignments uh, ready already. So we'll be getting back on the horse, as they say. But um, yeah, in a way, you know, COVID kind of enforces, forces you to have a little vacation. So <laughs> I, well, any type of that. sickness is sometimes what I think of God's way yeah. of telling us to slow down a little bit. <laughs> well, that's that's no doubt, uh, Pastor Boo, because like I said, we had all kinds of things that we said, man, we just have to get this done before Christmas. And I think it's funny how the Lord comes and says, no, you don't. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All those things that you thought were crucial and, and had, no, no, no. All you got to do is just trust in me and I'll, I'll, I'll take care of everything. So I uh, haven't had the house decorated yet. We hope to do that by the end of this week and stuff. But anyway, thank you. Well, I know you don't do this. Jenny assigns the text, but this is one fantastic, I think of, of all the chapters in Exodus, you couldn't ask for a better one than Exodus 24. 
things I never knew before. So I'm glad I had this chapter as well. So I learned some new things too. So I'm excited about the text. Yeah, it is a mysterious text. It has some uh, things that make you scratch your head, but at the same time, it is uh, not so focused on law as the past few chapters have been. There's this yeah. real strong element of God's grace and gospel, and we love it. I tell you what, let's get into it. But before we do, I'd like to invite you to start us off with prayer. Oh, Lord, we, we thank you uh, for the Advent, for the realization that you have come and you are coming and the anticipation that we enjoy this time of the year. Uh, I thank you for the fact that I am not really sick, and I certainly pray your blessing to all those who are really sick with all kinds of different ailments in this, this sinful world. But we pray most of all now by your Spirit, help us to see the joy that you give us in this chapter of Exodus 24, right in the midst, as Pastor Boo says, of all the law there, but also this beautiful promise of your your blood of the covenant, which is what it's all about. So help our hearts and minds to grasp these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, right. Well, I tell you what, I just want to read the first two verses. That'll just get us started. So then he said to Moses, come up to Yahweh, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to Yahweh, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. This is, um, in some ways, a little bit of a continuation of the previous chapter, and the next section talks about when he goes down to um, you know, tell this the, all these statutes to the people and get their get their uh, their buy-in, so to speak. But we're just starting off here. We have uh, some names. We have something a little different, right? It's been Moses alone. Now he's calling up these elders. Uh, Pastor, you know, set the stage for us. What's going on? Well, well, see, here's the thing. here's one of the first things that I, I never realized before. What we have in these first verses is, is the, the same structure we're going to have when they make the synagogue. Uh, not the synagogue, I'm sorry, the, the tabernacle. It's the same structure you're going to have in the temple. Uh, and, and that is you've got three divisions. Uh, you have the Holy of Holies in the temple. And, and nobody goes in the Holy of Holies except for one person, right? One person, the high priest gets to do that uh, only once a year, as a fact. So, so we got that same thing here, that the actual location where God is, only one guy is going to get to go there, and that's Moses. Everyone else has to kind of stand off. And then, of course, you have the holy place, which is still in the, the temple, but outside of the Holy of Holies. And there, there, there are more people. There are the people authorized uh, the people give them permission to do that because they have authority, they have vocation, they have work to do within that location. Uh, in this case, it's the priests, or rather, uh, in a temple, it's the priests. In this case, it'll be the elders, uh, so these chosen leaders of Israel. And then, of course, you have outside the temple, uh, which is the people. The people, they can't come into the holy place. They can't come into the holy place, but they can be there. They can be right around the temple. And you've got that same phenomenon going here on the mountain. And I thought... I never realized that before, that the whole pattern of how worship is going to be is already established here as God shows up on the mountain. But of course, for us as Christians, what makes that so super cool is we don't have those kind of divisions. We don't worry about that anymore. In fact, Paul says you can go right up into the throne of glory with confidence. So obviously, something has radically changed for us as Christians. Uh, if the pattern of the Old Testament is God is somebody you've got to stay distant from, the pattern of the New Testament is God is someone who, well, who even takes the little children up into his arms. Uh, uh, and, and as adults, sometimes we're not too excited about when little children come in. <laughs> but, but God apparently right. just wants everyone to be close to him. So I never realized that before, Phil, that whole pattern of, the, of those three divisions is established already here at God's presence on the mount. Yeah, that is a fascinating observation, and I'm, you know, I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking about it right now. Yeah, I guess I had never considered that before. You have this division already, and what's really great about the division, as you pointed out, is that the division no longer applies. Wow, what a yeah. what a neat observation, because um, we see this here, and we sometimes wonder about that, but God, as we've seen throughout the book of Exodus, God is a God of order. Now, one question I do have, brother, and that is about the 70 of the elders of Israel. You know, in my own sort of you know research, I've noticed that 70 people say everything from it's just a, uh, you know, a symbolic number to there were exactly 70. 
Uh, I don't know. What's your take on that? The 70 of the elders of Israel. Well, let me let me say, first of all, about the, the previous insight. I, I don't take any credit for that at all. <laughs> Anything I say that sounds like it's halfway smart, I probably read from somebody else. And, and that actually came from a Jewish commentary of all places. Uh, but now the 70 thing, well, again, like you said, that there's, there's arguments. Uh, some want to say, well, that's literally 70 elders. And, and, and it could be, obviously, as you already indicated, 70. And in fact, so many of the numbers in the Old Testament all have symbolic significance. Uh, 70, of course, has the number 10, which comes up over and over again, because it's like when you have 10 of something, you, you really have all you need. Uh, uh, seven, of course, is also a number that gets repeated. It's the number of creation. Uh, people have pointed out that you've got four corners of the earth. You've got the three persons of God. So maybe when you put the heavens and the earth together, you end up with seven. I, I don't know. what. Do you have any strong feelings about it? Obviously, when God starts talking numbers, there's, there's always significance to the numbers. And I think the significance here is, is all the elders that we need are there. There's nobody missing. Uh, and, of course, that pattern comes up constantly that there's people outside of the, 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 uh, the camp, well, but they're still part of the, the group that God has called. Well, that's a different story in a different chapter, but uh, I, I don't know. What, what's, your, what's your feeling, uh, Dr. Uh, well, uh, Dr. you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, I look at it, too, as you said, whenever God is using a number, whenever the Bible relates to us a number— there's generally some significance to it, and sometimes the significance is just very symbolic. Uh, what I've read, and again, you know, we don't have to make the disclaimers because you know everything everybody knows they've been taught by somebody, right? And Absolutely. so the um, seventy is the number of nations uh, that Yahweh disowned at, at Babel, and, and that I thought uh -huh. was an interesting connection. Now, whether that's the direct connection we're sh to be making here, I don't know. But it, it's fascinating because if if Yahweh disowns these sort of seventy nations at Babel then these 70 elders sort of represent a bringing back into the covenant uh, in a symbolic way all the people. Because remember, while we have – when we're dealing with God's chosen people that he freed from slavery in Egypt, ultimately God's plan is for all people to come to faith. And so you know, this representation, this synecdoche, the part of the greater whole of what is coming, and that connects to the observation you made earlier about – you know, this being a worship space, right? The 70 are coming in. The priests, though, represent the people. I mean, one of the reasons why, and we'll see this later in the text, that when he calls up these elders to, you know, witness God in, in the, the sapphire throne room, so to speak, uh, Moses goes down to all the people, but you can't bring everybody up because, well, it's just impractical. It's two and a half million of them. So these people represent the rest of the people. So even in this time, while we see these different categories with priests and high priests and elders, etc., the categories are there because God is a God of order. They represent all the people. Those priests and those civil leaders are at work for the people, and I think that's also important to keep in mind. This isn't God setting other people you know, as maybe more holy than others. So, so, so two things. The, the first thing that I think is so important— See, the, the problem is people will take these numbers and then they go up with all kinds of crazy things that have nothing else in Scripture to back them up. It's just they come up with some crazy idea. Uh, and, and as you were talking about the fact, well, maybe 70 is representative of the, of the, the nations that had uh, been cast aside uh, at, at uh, uh, Babel. Um, see, that's something that has to do with the Bible. And, and that's the one thing you got to do with numbers Whatever you do with the numbers, you've got to have something that's clear and, and definite elsewhere in Scripture in order to offer an explanation. You just can't take the number and come up like, like people do with the millennium, right? right? All of a sudden, now we've got this thousand-year reign of Christ, but there's nothing of that anywhere else in the Scripture. So, no, you can't do numbers that way. You can, you can find the things that are clearly taught in Scripture and then say, oh, here's an illustration of that clear teaching in the number that's used here. So that, that's, that's a good way to handle numbers. And I really think you're right. I, I think often numbers are just practical. And, and we have a, an agreement going on here between God and the people of Israel. It's a covenant he's making uh, between him and the people of Israel. And, and so there's going to be a very formal ceremony we're going to go through. And as you said, you can't get all the people up on the mountain. They just wouldn't fit. 
So we have to have representatives, and that's what the elders do. We, we do that all the time, don't we? So we, Pastor Boo, I, I don't right. go up to Washington, D.C. I have a representative who, who goes for me. So I, I, I think, see, there you go. I think that's all it is. And, and 70, well, again, we can wonder why 70 to represent them. But you're absolutely true. This is a representation of the entire people, even as the priests would be. Um, and so I you mean to say, well, so here. you mean to say, brother, that we shouldn't be taking the 70 people, multiplying it by the 12 tribes, dividing it by <laughs> the number of blood moons and, you know, <laughs> I mean, people do get, people they really do. do get worked up with these numbers. <laughs> and even in those cases where the numbers were significant and they were known to the people of the time, sometimes the, the space, that gap between us and the original uh, authorship it prevents us from fully understanding, and God's going to promise to keep the message that's important there. Sometimes we just have to trust God with the answers if we don't know them. So, so to just carry it to an extreme, you know, there are people that will actually take the the number of the Hebrew letters because every Hebrew letter has a number, just like you can number the twenty six letters, and and uh, there are twenty six. See, I'm six. I'm not sure. Yeah, twenty six letters in English. Uh, and, and then they'll they'll construct all kinds of things from the way those numbers show up in Scripture. And I'm thinking, yeah, probably not. I think God speaks the words, and He generally speaks rather plainly. Although there are sometimes He reminds us that this is not something we can understand by our own reason or strength, but only by the gift of the Spirit. So, uh, yeah, yeah, very good. Well, we also have the introduction of Nadab and Abihu, and it's interesting that these men are brought out uh, even right after Aaron in advance of mentioning the 70 elders of Israel. I guess some have said that these are the sons of Aaron, but we know what – well, not maybe not everybody knows, but something will happen with these folks uh, later on. And I guess it's also important that Moses, who's always writing after the effect, we must remember – He's including their names here, so everybody knows that they've been there since the beginning. They knew better. And, and you know, see, that's that's really the sad thing, isn't it? So even in this really blessed chapter, we've, we've got a reminder that even some of those who got to be there, you, you were talking about before being holy or being better, uh, that's why they were set apart here. Well, obviously, we know that's not why they were set apart, because these two sons of, of Aaron are going to uh, uh, commit the unholy, uh, unauthorized sacrifices and 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 they're going to they're going to be cut off they're they're going to lose their their position so so now you i didn't even think about that but now you've got me thinking maybe that's why they are listed here to just make sure people don't understand oh no god picked out the really really very best people and everyone else was left behind whereas the picture we're going to see throughout the book of genesis is everybody is a sinner everybody (laughs) even moses is going to turn out to be a sinner and so whatever's going on here in terms of God, it's all by his grace. So Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, uh, they don't get to come up uh, to dine with God because they're superior to the other people. Right. No, no, as we read this, we know for a fact, no, nope, they are sinners. And yet, yet they're part of the party, aren't they? They're, they're part of the celebration. Well, anyway, so... I do believe that's why they're mentioned. You know, I was going through the book of Genesis. We're about halfway through. We took a pause for a different topic for a while with my congregation. And one of the overarching themes that keep popping up about our beloved patriarchs is that they, as you said, are sinners. And so if the overarching message of Exodus is that the people are sinners, I think that's the message of Genesis too. And I'm going to go ahead and argue every other book in the Bible, right? God (laughs) alone is holy. And so when he gives us these rules and statutes and laws, which we've been you know, trudging through over the past few uh, weeks, actually, we, we have to remember that these are for our benefit. God is speaking to a people that he loves, whom he knows needs guidance, needs boundaries. All right, so let us move into the rest of uh, this section. So this is going to be verses 3 through 8. Here we go. Moses came down and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that Yahweh has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel, 
and he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to Yahweh. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that Yahweh has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. Well, this is a very, uh, how can we say it, a, a very graphic text, right? This would be rated very gory if it were on TV. It would have a, a, a PG-13 at the very least rating because we see all of this sacrifice and blood and people being sprinkled with the blood, and they are participating in the covenant, the covenant that's being cut by God. And it's sad that we kind of know what happens in the next few chapters, but just looking at it in the moment, God, God has sent Moses down to declare this with the people, and they, and it's said twice, in unison agree. I mean, that, in terms of brothers dwelling in unity and this universal proclamation, it's, it's beautiful in the moment. It's beautiful. And, and, yet, and yet, as you look carefully at what's going on here, you, you already see the hints that this is not going to work out the way the people at least think it's going to work out. Uh, I, I find it very striking that Moses has to come and tell the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. Now, now you, you had made some introductory comments, and so maybe we ought to talk about this. We're going off in a rabbit hole for just a second. Uh, um, Fine with me. So, so in Exodus 20, when when God gives the the the, the words the words I, I'm sure you talked about that when you did Exodus 20 we 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 say the Ten Commandments but that's not the biblical way of speaking they're, they're the Ten Devarim they're the Ten Words uh, uh, and and we have that emphasized here where it says He told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules so you had the words and then then you had that long section you just finished up with all the other rules that God was giving about all kinds of different different subjects. But 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 back in Exodus 20, we were told that, that they didn't really listen when God spoke to them originally. Um, in fact, they were frightened, and they said, no, we, we don't want to talk with him. We, we No, no, you go, you talk with him. Um, and, and here's another thing that, that I did not know before, uh, uh, Pastor Boo, but the Jewish tradition is, is that the people actually only listened to the first few verses of chapter 20, uh, for the verses where he said, you know, I'm the Lord who who set you free from slavery in Egypt, and he said, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, but but the Jewish tradition is after that, they really weren't paying attention, they weren't listening. And and, and the reason for the tradition, and again, how, how could I not have noticed this in my many years of studying the, the Decalogue, the, the Ten Devarim, have you ever noticed that in the first few verses, God speaks in the first person, I, the Lord, who delivered you out of Egypt. But when he gets to the, the business about uh, uh, honoring the Sabbath day and taking the name, all of a sudden he speaks in the third person, right? You should not take the name of the Lord. He doesn't say you should not take my name in vain, which is what would be consistent with what he said at the beginning. And, and so the Jewish tradition is, is then, no, no, that, that's actually Moses at this point telling them be, because they, they wouldn't listen to the Lord. Uh, well, whether that tradition is true or not, I, I think that's the irony here. That they're not really paying attention to what God is saying. And, and we don't pay attention either, see? I, I'll give you, this is what Jesus gets at, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount. So we hear God say, thou shalt not commit murder. And I'm going, I, I did that. Where's my where's my list? I can scratch that one off. I've never murdered anyone, <laughs> Pastor Boo. And of course, Jesus right. comes around and says, "Really? Are you sure? Maybe you need to think about this more. Maybe you really need to listen to what that means. Because if you've been angry with your brother, if you've hated your brother, if you've even called someone a fool, you, you've already broken that commandment." And of course, he does the same thing with adultery and lust. And I think that's the distinction we have here in the verse where he says he told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. Uh, the words of the Lord are these things that come and address our heart. And and if you really hear what the Lord says, you're going to have to confess what Jesus says, that out of the heart comes, and then there's a whole list of all the evil things that we do. You know, you're, you're certainly not going to say, oh, well, I can do that. See, 
uh, that's the foolishness we have here when they say, oh, we can do that. No, because if you really listen to the words of the Lord, you say, no, man, even if I want to do that, I, I, I cannot do that. Now, now, the rules, yeah, we can probably all keep the rules. You know, there's that long list of, of ceremonies and all that stuff that needs to be done, uh, things that would have to be enforced by by the law and the, 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 the judges and the courts. Yeah, we probably can all do that. But but the words of the Lord, the words of the Lord's law, you know, anybody who really, really listens to that it would have to confess, they'd have to confess. <laughs> That's what they'd have to do. They'd have to repent. Uh, and and, and I, I don't you get the impression here that, that so they say this, and Moses says, oh, oh, my God, you don't understand. So, all right, let's make the sacrifices. Because I'm telling you right now, you're not going to do it. So we're going to need to make the sacrifices. So let's get the animals We've been given commands about altars. Let, let's get the blood out because, cause, no, no, you're misunderstanding. And, and your whole history is going to be showing you that you cannot do these things by your own, by your own. So I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Do you think there's any truth in what I said there, Pastor Boo? Well, no, I think so. I think that makes a lot of logical sense in terms of, you know, God is declaring this and then Moses is then relating that to the people I guess I've always thought of the people not wanting to hear from God directly came from their fear, their fear, which is reinforced even by God himself when Moses seeks to be in the presence of God. And God says, well, no, you know, I'll I'll show you my the, the backside as I walk by that if you see God, uh, you know, you'll have trouble continuing to live. And so they're worried about that. I do think they're entering into this with ignorance, but at the same time, in any sort of covenant, the covenant is between two parties, in this case, Yahweh and the people of Israel. So Moses then comes down, and he tells all the people the words of the Lord. So he, he does use that word, right? The Debarim, uh, yes. Debarim Yahweh. And then all the rules, and the rules is hearkening back to, uh, what, 21, when he starts giving the rules on slavery, etc. What I've always wondered, though, is, is all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words, right, Debarim, that Yahweh yes, has yes. spoken, we will do. A couple of things stand out to me. One is I absolutely agree with you that Moses is probably looking at them going, yeah, no, you won't. On the other hand, <laughs> in a covenant, people do have to agree to the terms. And so they answered and agreed. The part that trips me up, and it always has, uh, I, when I was a kid, my family was involved in um, in a community theater, and sometimes you would have like the whole – everybody on stage would answer at the same time, and they would all say the same thing at the same time, and you would think, that seems so unrealistic that everybody's speaking the exact same. How do they all know what to say? So what this looked like when it says all the people answered with one voice – if it just said, and everybody agreed, it would make logical sense to me. Everybody in their own way is going, yes, we agree. But it actually gives a quote here. And so all two and a half million people are saying all the words that Yahweh has spoken, we will do, except in Hebrew, of course. So that seems so strange to me. Um, but aside from the strangeness of that construction, it's Moses is telling us that both parties have agreed to the covenant. And that's important because then when he when he cuts the covenant, when we think of cutting the covenant as often, you know, cutting the animal in two and walking between it. In this case, he sprinkles the blood on the people and the blood on the altar. But of course, he's not sprinkling it on everybody. It's it's kind of like a Gallagher concert. It's all the people in the front row. <laughs> so so we still have this kind of representation going on where everybody's involved, but I, I don't foresee that everybody in the entire congregation, which is moving across the, you know, the the, the wilderness and stages are all present at the same time. So I feel like this is something that's been conflated that actually takes a lot longer to take place as the leaders then teach them to their their people and the fathers teach it to their children, et cetera. Uh, but that's just my thoughts in my head. Um, you know, be far from me to question exactly how it's written. And, and, and you know, I, 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 I think I agree with you and, and all of that, uh, especially in the fact that we have a very – formal ceremony ceremony going on and, and we know from from the, 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 the studies we've done of other cultures and other religions this is not unique to the Jews uh, the idea of cutting a covenant and you, you use that 
uh, word repeatedly because that's the language that's used with a covenant, and it does involve Abraham did the same thing, right? He 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 cut the animals up in half, and and then God walked uh, between them. Uh, so, so so I think you're right. I, I think it's just like w- when we get up and and we sing the national anthem, we all know the words. We we know that's what you're supposed to say. Uh, and I think you're right. I think everyone knows. Okay, yeah, we we've got the the, the Debarim and the rules, and well, we know that we will do these things. And in fact, uh, the second time around, we really want to emphasize that we're going to do them. So we don't just say we'll do them, but we will be obedient. Uh, uh, but but see, I think it's almost kind of like Peter. Remember when Jesus said, "Well, you're going to deny me," and Peter knows. Oh no, I'm not. No, I'm not going to deny you. I'll I'll go to prison. I'll, I'll die for you. And Jesus, of course, is just. Rubbing his head, saying, okay, okay, Peter. And, and I want to say that, too. I'm not criticizing the people here. If you and I were there, we would say the same thing. And mm-hmm. we'd probably say it because it's what we need to say, and it's what the group is saying. And my gosh, we do that in church, right? We say, Lord, have mercy, because we know that's what we say. But see, maybe that's the problem here. It's not saying it. No, no, it's got to it's gotta come from the heart. Otherwise, it's it's nothing. It's just meaningless. See, that's the difference between your words and the words of the Lord. My words and the words of the Lord. My words don't necessarily mean anything. When the Lord speaks them, they're always from the heart. He never says anything that he doesn't fully and completely mean. Uh, but I think that's the beauty of this this whole thing. So, so Moses says, well, I, you guys don't know what you're talking about. In fact, uh, you know, I know that it, it'll be a little over a month, and you're going to break the number one commandment. But but no, Moses says we got to keep doing what God has given us to do. We make the sacrifices. We're going to take the blood because that's going to change everything. That's going to take the empty words and put them in our hearts and make them things full of meaning and make them things of faith, uh, not just things we say because it's part of the ceremony to say them. Well, folks, that's something for us to think about, though. But while we take a break. So we are going to do that when we come back. Pastor Lekomsky and I will keep on going with Exodus chapter 24. We'll see you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend John Lukomsky, co-host of Wrestling with the Basics, also on Worldwide KFUO. Well, before we jump back into the text, folks, I want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments about today's show or you want to get in touch with my guest, feel free to direct them or contact me at pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. Well, Pastor Lukomsky, before the break, we were kind of getting into this idea where the people are all assenting with one voice, whether that's this literal, instantaneous, you know, motivated by the Holy Spirit uh, in unison, all the words of Yahweh will do, or whether it's sort of a little bit more of a gradual thing. Regardless, the people are consenting, assenting to this covenant, and we know and you talked about the people who may be just going through the motions, and there are undoubtedly plenty. I would also add that there are probably people who really, 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 really mean it, but it's coming from a place of naivete that they could actually keep it, that it's not really about the Lord because the Lord is going to show time and again that he's really the only one that can ever uphold either end of the bargain. So, so, so Pastor Boo, man, man you have in, you've inspired me. So, so, so think with me for just a second. So, so this whole formula that we're doing here, this is not new. This is common. 
Uh, in fact, these people, I'm sure, have encountered it in their interactions with people of other nations. Uh, usually it's not between God and people. It's usually between the king and, and the people. So that's unique here, uh, that mm-hmm. God is all of a sudden giving rules and directions, because usually that comes from your government that gives you the rules and directions. So that's unique. That's one thing special. But we all know how it works. And like you said, it's a two-part thing. So we, we come and, and, and uh, we we have our representatives there. God, of course, is there representing himself. Uh, you even see that in the sacrifices they're offering. Uh, it's, note that the, the detail is interesting that there were burnt offerings, which, of course, are the offerings that are literally burnt. They're all consumed. You, there's nothing left. That all goes to, to the God that you are sacrificing to. But then there's also the, the, the fellowship offerings. Or I think the word in the English there is peace, but it really means the, uh, the, the fellowship offerings. And, and, and those offerings, no, you, you don't burn it all up. You keep some of it and you eat it. So, so we've got this kind of mutual thing going on between us and God, and we're, we're used to that, right? Here, here's what we need to do. Well, of course, so we know the responses. We will do this thing. But then something happens in this that would not have happened in any other kind of secular covenant, because Moses does a really crazy thing. He keeps some of the blood, all right? Now, if you go look at the, the other covenants that are described in other cultures, no, no, you have the sacrifice, that's it, right? We've made an agreement with God, we made our sacrifices, he gave us the rules, that's the end of it. But the people, I'm sure, wonder, well, what, what's Moses, what's got all those basins full of blood for? What, what's that all about? Well, well okay, we, we know we're supposed to say, yes, we will do it, we will do it. We, in fact, we will be obedient. And then what does he do? He takes the blood and spatters it on him. And I have a suspicion that they had no idea what to do with that because that's not part of the usual covenant ceremony. Why would he have to throw blood on us? But of course, as we're going to discover as we go through the Bible, that's the only way that covenant's going to be fulfilled. It's not going to be fulfilled by you doing it. I mean, you said the right thing. We're not, we're not arguing about that. Isn't that true? All of us as Christians, we should want to keep the law. And if we would say we don't want to keep the law, then there's a fundamental problem. But but as you already pointed out, there's the the issue that we, we really can't we we cannot do it uh, as it should be done done perfectly. So there's got to be something else. And here in this very unique Jewish covenant, there is something different, and that is the blood that gets splattered on us. I think that is definitely something that's worth pointing out. You know, blood would not have been absent from you know the Near East ancient uh, covenants. Blood would have existed because of the sacrifice of animals or the the uh, cutting in half of animals. I'm, I'm laughing behind my my breath because uh, when we covered this in my class, we, we talked about the covenant of Abraham. And when the the carcass of the animal was cut in half, and one of my people asked if that was hamburger style or hot dog style. I don't know if you remember me talking about that. And I think I might have asked you. Like if it was from head to tail or if it was just sideways across. And anyway, I don't remember what we decided. The point is blood was there. And the implication is sort of like if you break this covenant, what happened to this animal will happen to you. And yes. so if it, these people are, are a couple months out of slavery and then previous to that 400 years in slavery, how much they had absorbed from the surrounding cultures, I don't know. But I, I couldn't agree with you more that when that blood – which ordinarily would have just sort of absorbed into the ground. Right? Yeah, yeah. And your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. But but in this case, yeah, it's thrown on them. I, yeah, I'm just contemplating what you're saying. And I imagine that would take it, it definitely would bump it up a notch. It takes it from, you know, <laughs> this is the consequences of breaking this covenant to there are people going home with blood on their clothes. And that's something that they're thinking about. Um, and and blood is so important to the covenantal relationship we have with God, which the Mosaic Covenant begins here, and then it continues, and we see that fulfilled in the blood of Christ, of course, but it's so important. And yet here we are in a culture that is so removed from blood. You know, you get your, your steak at the steakhouse, and it's bloody. Well, that's not even blood, right? That's just liquid and hemoglobin. You know, you get your, uh, you get your beef at the market. That's not blood. And so unless you're out in the country or, or you know, you, you're around animals, the vast majority of people in the world are so far separated even from the blood of the animals to the point where 
where the sight of blood to some people makes them pass out. And here we have blood in, in this in a sort of cathartic, real way being applied to the people. And one day, God knows that we will all need to be washed in the blood of a sacrificial animal. Or in this case, of course, God, who is our, the Lamb of God, Christ Jesus. Yeah, I, 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 I really like those comments, too, because I'm thinking, you know, uh, back in the old days, if you got injured uh, on the basketball court and you bled a little bit, that's no big deal. Let's go play basketball. Whereas now, oh, my God, they come in, they rush in right away. They got the band-aids. They got the wraps. Oh, <laughs> you know, like, but yeah. Uh, and I didn't think of it that way because in the old days, again, we, we butchered animals. We knew what that was like. We found right. the pigs up. We slit them up the gut and watched the blood pour out. And the good Germans would make the blood sausage from that. Uh, and you're right. Maybe we, we've lost something because we, we distance ourselves from that visceral, that, that, that blood, uh, because that's the point here. Hey, you, you want to talk about salvation. It's going to take some real sacrifice, not just sacrifices that you make and then you eat some of the meat and then you walk on. And no, no, no. That, that's, uh, and of course, you're right. That, that's what's great about this chapter, uh, that phrase, blood of the covenant. And, and, you know, that, that, that there, there's no other time in the Old Testament where you have this kind of blood and, 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 and the covenant, that this is unique. Uh, not that there isn't blood in every sacrifice. Of course there is. But it all goes back to this thing, this blood of the covenant. And, of course, it's, it's the language that Jesus picks up in the Lord's Supper. So this, is, this is the blood of the covenant. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just a reminder that everything you and I are talking about here is only a shadow. And we can't really truly understand what's going on here in this text until Jesus shows up and suffers and dies on the cross. And then we say, oh, that's what it was all about. The fact that, that all men are sinners, all have fallen short of the glory of God, as the, the psalmist tells us. But but now Jesus, Jesus has done what we have not been able to do. But But that wasn't just a matter of him just being a nice guy. No, that was a matter <laughs> of him making the sacrifice. That, that, right. that needs to be made. That needed to be made, yeah. The uh, He says in verse 7, he took the book of the covenant. I just want to point out for listeners that uh, most people understand this to be chapters 20 through 23 is essentially the contents of that book of the covenant, yeah. those those laws and those sorts of things. Uh, brother, uh, can we move on to the next couple of verses? Because uh, this is, has a beautiful vision. So then starting with verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy elders, or seventy of the elders of Israel, went up, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. All right, just those three verses. A, a couple of things I just want to point out. And first of all, we have this sort of curious phrase that they saw the God of Israel, and that's curious in the context of Moses wanting to see God later. So did he not now? And then also this pave, pavement of sapphire stone. I've heard very good arguments about how – they're really irrelevant, but they're interesting – about how the tablets of the Ten Commandments may have been inscribed in giant sapphire stones. Again, irrelevant, but interesting to think about. So, brother, what do you think? Uh, they're going up here and they're and they're and they're eating and the pre- eating and drinking in the presence of God. I think that's the most important part. But what a what a wild scene! So, uh, yeah, see, obviously, when I'm reading it, I'm thinking, wait a second. I, I thought I was told I can't see God, and now all of a sudden they are seeing God. Uh, and and uh, I read any number. It, it's something we're not sure we wrestle with. Uh, the two things that that struck me is that it's interesting that it then says they beheld, they beheld God. Uh, that's the second word that is used there. And, and that word uh, is usually used of the prophets and their visions. Uh, Isaiah beholds God. Amos beholds God. There, there's a couple other instances where that particular Hebrew word is used for what the prophets see. And so I think maybe that's what we have here. They're not actually seeing God uh, with their, their bare eyes, but they're seeing a vision of God, uh, and it is interesting that while we have a very, and I like that, I think that's a really cool insight that maybe we always picture them as being these salt, but maybe they're sapphire stones that they're written on. That would really be cool, wouldn't it, Pastor Boo? I can just picture that in my head. Uh, but anyway, the fact that we don't actually get a description of God, 
we, we, we get a description of what he was standing on, but not God himself, which I think reaffirms again that, no, we're not actually seeing, seeing God, but we have a vision of the Lord. Although what's really neat is even if you have a vision of the Lord, you're at risk, right? So the right. Moses has to comment, well, God didn't wipe him out. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, isn't it Isaiah says, oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe, woe is me. When he comes into the vision of God, so so yeah, anything where God comes in His holiness is a very very scary place to be. Unless, of course, as we said earlier, unless you're covered with the blood of the Lamb, and then then it's not scary at all. Then you you can rather just come in with confidence, uh, as Paul says. Well, I think one thing that's important to remember, too, is that God's the one who makes the rules. So he says very clearly in Exodus 19 that people can't get too close lest they be destroyed. Yeah. But then in this verse, it just specifically says, and he and it says he did not lay his hand on them. Uh, actually, I think the Hebrew is more he did not stretch out his hand against them. So basically, despite what he said in his summoning them up, he's given them this precious opportunity to see well him or a vision of him or a representation of him and yet come out unharmed. And this isn't something that they should seek on their own because when Moses does it, well, what, in about 10 chapters, Moses tries to say, well, can I see you maybe again? Then God says, no, I, I'm going to dictate the rules upon which you can see me. And that, I think, has eternal consequences, too, because then throughout history, people have tried to dictate how they will approach God. And God has said, no, it's not that I don't want you to approach me. It's that I want you to approach me on my terms. And then he sends us Jesus who we can behold and not die, and through whom we can have access to the Father and not be afraid, but not on our terms. We have to remember that we're creatures. He's the creator. And and so what what's going to happen then is if they actually did see uh, a God, then they're going to make an idol of him and they'll worship the idol rather than realizing, no, it's not. It, it's yeah. God himself. That's what you need, not some representation you've made of God, and that's exactly what they'll do. They'll use their imagination because they don't have anything else to use. But uh, you're absolutely right. We, we can't make up our own ways to come into God. In fact, the Bible is pretty clear about it. there's only one way. No one comes to the Father but by me, Jesus says. See, mm-hmm. So uh, put aside any thoughts about we have to see God, we have to know what he looks like, because the fact of the matter is we do know what he looks like. He looks like Jesus, uh, the full glory of God was was uh, found there in Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, this is what goes on in, in worship. You know, we come into worship, and we confess our sins, and, and we acknowledge that all we should get from God is we should. His harm should reach out and get us, right? We should have temporal and eternal punishment. And yet what's neat is at the end of the service, we're doing what they're doing in this text. We're actually there at table eating and drinking with the Almighty Holy God. Uh, why again? Because of the body given and the blood of the covenant shed for us. So I, I think this is so cool because we, we read this, and yet this is the same thing that we do every Sunday, only better, only better. Because uh, these people are going to leave, and, and there's still going to be so much question and doubt. And, and when we leave a church service, oh, oh no, it's it's okay. We, we're not perfect. We have sin. We confess that. And we know that'll continue to be an issue, but we, we've got the blood, and, and that's made all the difference in the world. Yeah, I think that's what this is just so important for us to understand, I should say. You know, this isn't the first time that Moses in Exodus has talked about uh, eating with God. Uh, we see back when Jethro came and gave him his advice, this is in chapter 18. In verse 12, it says, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So this is this very um, – kind of like you know, basically they had this fellowship meal in the presence of God in the sense that they had just sacrificed to him in his altar. So this one steps it up even more, and now they see God in the way that he wishes to be seen. And they eat and they drink in his presence while beholding God. So not before God in terms of they're doing it in front of the altar. Now they're doing it literally in front of God. And now, as you pointed out, in these last days, we eat and drink and not just in the presence of God and not just before the altar, but we literally put into our bodies the true body and blood of Jesus, God himself, 
who saves us from our sin. For those who say, well, you know, I just think that worship needs to be more experiential. Uh, they are not paying attention. <laughs> there is nothing more experiential <laughs> than consuming the very uh, true sacrifice body and blood of God himself. So uh, I tell you what, anything else on that before we go on to the next uh, passage? Because we just have a few minutes left in the show, and we still have a handful of verses. Okay. All right, well, here we go. And Yahweh said to Moses, starting with verse 12, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you, and behold, Haran and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain, and the glory of Yahweh dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of Yahweh was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Just there, we could spend another hour on this, but just maybe hit the top, top uh, topics here, the, the, the hot spots. You know, we have this uh, six days and God coming on the seventh. We, of course, have the 40 days and 40 nights. We have lots of stuff going on here. Uh, what's the most important that you want to get across, brother? Well, well uh, maybe, maybe since we only have a, a few minutes, uh, to realize that this final paragraph is actually leading us into what is going to come. Uh, the whole business about the, the, the commandments on the tablets of stone, uh, the whole business about the glory of the Lord, uh, the 40 days and 40 nights is all laying the groundwork for the terrible thing that's going to happen in the next few chapters. After having said, oh, oh we'll do everything you've said, they, they turn around and break the very first commandment and make for themselves a graven image, which was the number one commandment. <laughs> And they right. heard that. They heard that not only from Moses, but they heard it in their own ears. So so that's what's important about this paragraph. We're kind of laying the groundwork for what's going to come. And here's the thing. I Again, a new thing I learned. What's the thing you're going to talk about tomorrow? Uh, the, the, the setting up of the sanctuary. And I realized, oh, well, of course, that's the whole point. We, we've had a sanctuary here. God is his abode is, is with the people. He's a by it. The, 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 the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like the devouring fire on the top of the mountain. And the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. So this is God coming and dwelling with his people. But he's not going to stay on Mount Sinai because they're not staying in Mount Sinai. They're heading off to the promised land. So now we're going to have the structure and the, the, the things that God has laid out. Like you said, this is not a human way of coming to God, but this is how God will want people to know that he's still present with them. So I thought, well, how appropriate is that? We've got God on the mountain, but now we're going to see how God can be with us as we leave Mount Sinai, and we've got this whole structure of the sanctuary. Um, so I think that's one of the key things to see, that this is actually leading ahead to all of the rules that the Lord will give them, which, again, are not given because he likes to boss people around, but they're given because he wants people to know his love and his mercy and his presence. And see, when we take things on ourselves, uh, Pastor, then, we're, then we got questions. And we're wondering, well, did I do it right or did I not do it right? But what, when, when the Lord comes and says, well, here's, here's how you can know that I'm present with you. Oh, okay. Then, then there's no doubt. Uh, when I go, and, and, and the Lord told me when he says, uh, this is my body and my blood, that is his body and blood, well, then I don't have to worry about that. It's hard to believe true sometimes, but no, he's pretty well established that he's there with the forgiveness of sins, even as when the pastor says your sins are forgiven, even as when when I'm baptized and God says baptism saves you. So so anyway, uh, what would you see in these last things? I, I mean, like you said, we could talk about the numbers and stuff and their symbolism and all that. Of course, the big thing, Jesus, he's also, you know, 40 days and 40 nights in a wilderness, but uh, I, I'll stop. <laughs> well, I'll just add, and I can't add much more than that, but I can just add that I think that even in the devouring fire, we see grace because we know that God knows at this point that if people were to see him, they would die. And so he protects yeah. them with this cloud. So even at the very beginning, he's protecting his people. And as you brought out earlier, I want to emphasize that now there is no cloud between us. There is no barrier. There are no priests through which we have to go. We are are a nation of priests because of Jesus, the only intercessor between us and the Father. 
and and I would throw in one final comment. We've now gone full cycle for Moses, isn't it? Because he started off when God revealed to him as also a devouring fire uh, in the form of a bush that would not be consumed. And so I think this is good for Moses, too, that, okay, this is the same God who, same guy. who started me off, and he's still here with us now uh, in, in, in the wilderness. So, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend John Lukomsky, Pastor Emeritus and co-host of Wrestling with the Basics on KFUO Radio. And folks, I'm so glad that you were with us here today. Come back tomorrow as we advance one chapter when we'll be privy to God's detailed instructions for the holy things of his tabernacle, including the Ark of the Covenant. So don't miss it. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray. Father, keep us in thy strong word.